going to make this personal about my own journey, particularly about my evolving understanding of the Holy Scriptures, more so than this particular issue, because I think that was my assignment. All right, because in the end, it seems like the issues of differences have have usually come down to how we interpret and understand the scriptures. And I've been studying the scriptures for quite a while. Many of you have been studying them far longer than I have. I think my journey began in the summer of 1979 and I went to Princeton Seminary to start taking Greek. And I went through seminary for a few years and then became a pastor right after that. So a lot of years have gone by and some of my views have changed. And some of my views have certainly evolved. The other thing that was part of the assignment was to try to give a consensus view or an overall view about how Presbyterians approach Scripture. And while I think there is a sort of general consensus in the PC USA, which is our denomination, if you take all the reformed bodies, from the more conservative to the more liberal, you're probably not going to get a consensus. And historically, um, there have been differences for quite a long time. When Princeton Seminary was first started in 1812, the primary way of looking at scripture was more what we call fundamentalist or inerrant. And there were a lot of controversies around that. And basically, that was the position of the Presbyterian Church until around 1923, when some more modern or liberal, though I don't like really using those words, began to evolve. It seems like one thing that we can all though, agree on is, as we approach Scripture, is the centrality of Jesus Christ and the message of the New Testament. For instance, we, none of us that I'm aware of, feel like we need to obey Old Testament dietary restrictions. Uh, there was a great vision that Paul had about that as a strict Jew, but we, of course, are always going to go towards what the New Testament said or, or what Jesus said. All right, so just a few remarks, first of all, about the Bible in general, because to me, these insights to me, are important in approaching the whole thing, all right? So, one of the things that I think is important for, for Christians to always remember is that the Bible is a Bible, and the Bible means a collection. And that's why we have things like the Fisherman's Bible and the Gardener's Bible and all these other Bibles. It is a collection of various authors, various literary genres that were written over many, many hundreds of years. Perhaps the earliest documents of the Bible go back to 1200 B.C., and then the very latest ones would have been uh, something like the Gospel of John, which could have been written close to 100 A.D. So between those years, you have a lot of different things going on. Um, it became a sacred text, but many, if not most of the writings, were not written to be sacred texts, okay? I think that's important to remind ourselves of that. Um, for instance, when Paul was writing his letters to the Corinthians and the Colossians and the Galatians, he was just writing letters to the Corinthians, Colossians, and Galatians. He was not thinking that this was going to be in some sacred text one day. Uh, and I think that's important to remind ourselves of that. Even the Hebrew Scriptures, which go back much further than the, than the Greek or the New Testament Scriptures, were not canonized, were not formulated into what even the Jews believe was a sacred text until the first century AD. Okay? So, so that's also important to remember. It was a process. Some books were accepted, some were rejected. Even today we have certain books of the Bible that we wonder, why is it in there? I mean, let's be honest, there are some that are, are somewhat puzzling to us. Um, why is the book of Esther in a Christian Bible, which the word God is never used, it's very important to the Jews, but this is really that important to the Christians. The Song of Songs is interesting, but it's hard to understand and so forth. Um, so uh, the, the process took a long time. It took hundreds of years. And there are still books that some people like to read that, that didn't make it into what we call the canon or the measuring rod of 
pluck God in, we pluck God out. Okay, so next I'm going to share, now I'm going to transfer to, I think these things are things that are sort of in the indisputable category. This is just, this is the way it was, okay? The canon, the canon is the canon. The process of the canon is the process of the canon. Whether you're liberal or conservative, there's really no debate about those things because they're historically verified. But now I'm going to venture into some things that perhaps you might disagree with and are more some of my beliefs that they've evolved over time. Okay. So here's my first one. The Bible is both human and sacred, or human and sacred book or collection of books. For example, this is something I've, I've heard Sid say from the pulpit, which I think is a perfect example of this. Can we say, for instance, that Paul was truly inspired by God, the breath of God, when he said, I have been crucified in Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That sounds like sacred text to me. But then when he said things like women should cover their heads and shouldn't speak out in church, could we agree that he was just speaking as a first century man who had his own biases about stuff like that? And that's not really something that should be a, a, a something sacred for us. Okay. All right. You may not agree with that, but that's, that's what I agree with. Okay. And there, would be, there could be countless examples of that. Uh, and another thing I think we, have, we should admit if we can, but I think it's important that we do admit it, no matter how hard we try, we are all going to be affected by our cultural biases as we read and try to understand the Bible. Let me give you a simple example. I think in, they say from the Enlightenment on, most Western people have been highly influenced by two major thoughts. One is rationality. Is it rational? Does it make sense? Does it hold up to reason? And secondly, inclusivity, which has become more and more a cultural bias of ours. It's not a bias that other people around the world hold at all. But for us, it's almost like a sacred bias to be inclusive, to be welcoming and, and, uh, and, and, under, and tolerant of, of all peoples and respect other people's traditions. Whereas other peoples in other world have no intention of respecting someone else's traditions at all. It's not something that's in their cultural bias, okay? So when we come to the Bible, we're going to put those biases on as a layer on top of our lens of reading the Bible, whether we, whether we want to or not. I think it's just as human beings, we're just going to do it. Um, while the Bible is timeless, it is undoubtedly true that people through time have used and misused the Bible in different ways, okay? Now, I just think that's, I think that is just true. Um, my favorite example is, in the Civil War, most Southern Presbyterians, this is well documented, most Southern Presbyterians believe that slavery was approved and ordained by the Bible, and therefore it was unbiblical for them to give up their slaves or believe in abolition, okay? There were even some Southern Presbyterians after the war who were so upset about this that they moved to Brazil and formed colonies so that they could continue to own slaves, okay? Now, I think probably in 2015 we would all agree that this was a misuse of reading of the Scriptures. There have probably been some misuses that have happened today and yesterday, of course. But it, it just goes on. Um, while the Bible has enduring truths to guide all people and at all times, it does not speak to every need or anticipate every dilemma. Okay, we wish it did. It sure would be good if it did. We can look hard. We can dig. We can dig. We can get out our concordances and look up every word we can think of. But darn it. There's going to be some things that there's just nothing in there about that. And, and one of them is a covenanted relationship between two people of the same sex who want to live in holy matrimony. Nothing about that in the Bible. Uh, there's other things about sexuality in plenty, but not about that. Many, many other examples could be mentioned. God is bigger than the Bible. God is bigger than the Bible. What 
we know now about interstellar space and atomic physics and all this stuff, it, it goes beyond the most majestic songs, perhaps, you might say. Um, and even some of the early reformers said that one could make an idol or a false god out of the Bible, out of the, out of the Bible, yes. So, in other words, the Bible is so very important to Christians, it always has been and it always will be, but God is going to always be better than the Bible. You can't put God inside a text like that, because God is God, is God and God can, cannot possibly be, be um, forced into a sacred text. And, and to think of our expanding knowledge of the universe and of human nature and science and everything, and perhaps even our own uh, possibilities of writing sacred texts or having sacred insights have gone on. I mean, there's been a lot of time has passed since the very last book of the New Testament was written. The Bible is awesome, but it is not my only source of inspiration, nor is it my only source of my knowledge of God. Okay? And that one might be a little, a little, little controversial, but I think if we're honest, for most of us that's true. The Bible may be our primary source, and I suppose that it should be our primary source of inspiration, and, and our primary source of knowledge of God, for sure. Okay? But, may we all admit that there are other sources of inspiration for us, whether it be through nature. Haven't we all had experiences where, whether they be mountaintop experiences, or out hiking, or something, where you're out looking at the stars at night, like uh, Walt was telling a story during the New Elder Retreat about going out to some place where there was no ambient light from the city and just seeing the shooting stars going on and on and on. And you could just get some amazing insight about God there that perhaps you wouldn't from reading the scriptures. Or from other authors, poets, musicians, writers, films that you've seen, etc. The great summations like the Golden Rule, Ten Commandments, Micah 6, are very helpful when you have a hard subject like sexuality issues to figure out. So, to me, that's a very important, very important subject. Now, I have brought um, enough copies for everyone, and I'll just leave them here. But it's, it is a, a very useful guideline called Seven Guidelines for Interpreting Scriptures. And so, I wanted to go over those, and these are attempts by the PCUSA, though it goes back to some documents that are several decades old now, about how to interpret scripture and some guidelines for that. But before I read those and discuss those, I wonder if you have any questions or comments. No? Okay. All right, so here are these seven guidelines that you can all take home with you later and, and read. Uh, recognize that Jesus Christ is the center of Scripture. Okay, that was the one I started with. Number two, let the focus be on the plain text of Scripture to the grammatical and historical context rather than allegory or subjective fantasy. Okay. I think that's, that's, that's a very good one. And that's why, as pastors, we studied the Bible in, a, in more depth than, than one might as, um, as an elder, a deacon, a church member, because we have to interpret the text for the congregations year after year, week after week, and we've had to learn the biblical languages and delve into it in a deeper way to understand the historical context. Number three, depend upon the guidance of the Holy Spirit in interpreting and applying God's message. Okay, I think that's something we all can agree on, though one might differ as to how you felt led by the Holy Spirit, it's because it's ultimately going to be a subjective experience. Be guided by the doctrinal consensus of the church, which is the rule of faith. 
Okay, and I'm going to say something more about that in just a minute. Let all interpretations be in accord with the rule of love, the twofold commandment to love God and love neighbor. That's like the, like the last one I used, which I said, those big overreaching commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Those can be overarching like a rainbow almost to help us when we have difficulties. Remember that interpretation of the Bible requires earnest study in order to establish the best text and to interpret the influence of the historical and cultural context in which the divine message has come. Now, um, you may not understand this issue about the best text, but one of the things that we had to learn in seminary is that almost every single sentence, if not word, of the Bible, particularly, has been studied in more depth than New Testament, have varying texts, okay, from ancient scriptures. So, in a Greek Bible, for instance, there will be, at the bottom of the Greek Bible, there will be alternate texts given from different ancient scriptures, ancient uh, manuscripts. Thank you, that was the word I was looking for, manuscripts. So, in many cases, it could be completely irrelevant. It might be a preposition instead of an article, a comma here, or not a comma there, which really doesn't affect the meaning of it. But in some cases, it could be quite significant. And so you have to say, do you use the Masoretic text? Do you use the Ethiopian text? Do you use... And there's, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of them. And there was a, one of the professors that, that Sid and I both had at Princeton, Bruce Metzger, had developed, had devoted his entire life to studying the alternate texts and then trying to decide which one was the most reliable based on its authenticity, how clean it was, as in how, how destroyed it was, because some of these ancient texts have holes in them, burns in them, scratch-offs in them, and things like that. That's not to, to give us any pause about the sacredness of the Scripture. It's just, that's just the way it is. These are ancient, old texts, and some of them got messed up in floods and fires and, and rotten mildew and so forth. And so people have devoted their lives to studying all these texts. It's not like the whole thing just came down from heaven in a perfect thing right off the press. I mean, that would have been fantastic if that had happened that way, but it just didn't happen that way. Um, seek to interpret a particular passage of the Bible in light of all the Bible. Okay? So I think that's a very useful one on this book. Now, there's one other paragraph I want to read to you. This is a book that I think we probably can still get copies of. It's a little bit older, called Presbyterian Understanding and Use of Holy Scripture, Biblical Authority and Interpretation. It actually has a chapter about that Princeton controversy, going back to 1812, I mentioned. And then this one is a more uh, recent one called Using the Bible, a guided study of Presbyterian statements on biblical authority and interpretation. Now, the thing I want to read here that I thought was good is, is about... Confe being confessional, what we call confessional, because we are a confessional church, as in our uh, book of, um, our constitution includes the book of order, which is more the rules of governance, and then we have the book of confessions. Our confessions are not sacred scripture, they are not to be paralleled with the Bible, but they are texts that go back a long way in the case of the Nicene and Apostles' Creed, very, very early. Um, text, and we use those confessions also because they were created by very earnest and pious Christian people from our ancestors who did their very best in prayerful discernment to come up with what we are to believe and, and how we are to conduct ourselves. And so this, I think, is, is, worth, is worth repeating. <coughs> The confessions establish limits within which they may be invoked as a guide and outside of which one may no longer be operating within the Reformed tradition. For example, we may not claim as confessional the position that the Bible is an inerrant account of technical information on matters of science. 
Okay? Alright, so there are some things we've learned from science. If you're a scientist, a medical professional, whatever, you know that there are some things in science that may be differing. The people that wrote the Bible did not understand, in many cases, even that the earth was round, for instance, and that it um, orbited around the sun, or something like that that we take for granted now. Nor, on the other hand, may we claim confessional support if we treat Scripture only as an account of ancient religious history. All right? So that might be something you get in a class in college, or you take a class in, at UNCG. You might get a professor that really isn't a believer, might be a, an excellent historian, but they're going to be treating the text as an ancient religious history. And they're not going to be coming at it from faith. And as Christians, that is not an appropriate way of looking at Scripture. One is not confessional in arguing that God is revealed by the Spirit in contradiction to Scripture. Alright, so you can't have this insight about God, and then there's something in the Scripture that contradicts that. So, that's, that's a good one. One cannot find confessional support for the claim that only human reason, without reference to Scripture, is a reliable spiritual guide. So that would be an example of using reason way beyond its intended use. To say, well, it just doesn't make sense, and I don't care if it's in the Bible, it doesn't make sense, and I'm not paying any attention to it. Now, there might be some examples where that could be appropriate. Uh, I think most of us now don't believe in polygamy, it, if it's hard enough for a man and a woman or two people to get along as it is, and why would you pick on women being the only ones that are of the multitude? I mean, that doesn't make sense either. Why would you not have uh, a woman having five husbands, for instance? And yet that's something that doesn't make sense to us and we probably aren't going to pay any attention to. It. One would be as contra-confessional in asserting either that the Bible has no normative relevance for contemporary conduct, or that the Bible provides absolute and detailed laws for every act in human affairs. All right, now I might probably need to read this one again. So, you would be going against the consensus of Presbyterian wisdom if you said that we can't use the Bible to make decisions about current events. It's, it's irrelevant. No, that's not. We, we, we shouldn't say that. The Bible is relevant, okay? Nor that the Bible provides absolute and detailed laws for every act of human affairs, which is one of the things I said. It doesn't. We wish it did, but it doesn't connect to every single issue that, that we come up with or that we face. Maybe some people believe it does, and I would be open to, to understanding and respecting that very deeply, but my experience would be that there's not something in the Bible for, for, for everything. Um, now, I think the last thing I wanted to do, which should give us uh, plenty of time to have some discussion if we want, is another thing that I've heard a lot about in script, about scripture and interpreting scripture is that this this thing what some people call the slippery slope, okay? And that would be that well, if we if we if we just decide that that's irrelevant and we just don't want to hear it, like it's in the Bible, but I don't want to hear anything about it because it messes up what I want to do with my life, then that's a slippery slope, okay?